So now we're going to look at the internal structures that are specific to prokaryotic cells. And the chromosome or nucleoid region is pretty interesting in bacteria, mainly because they don't have that nuclear membrane surrounding it to protect it. So the chromosome is in the form of a single circular double-stranded DNA helix. It's super coiled upon itself to save space. And in that electron micrograph to your right, the nucleoid region or chromosome is indicated by the red color. Now, if you look really, really carefully throughout the cell, there are some additional um, segments of red, if you will, and that's the plasmids. So sometimes they're, you know, they don't necessarily appear circular um, in nature, but the plasmids themselves are less than 10% of the chromosome size, but they can carry up to several hundred genes. They're usually composed of unused genetic information, kind of nonsense DNA, if you will. But there are some that are called R factors, and those plasmids code for the production of enzymes that destroy antibiotics. They're called R factors because it makes the bacteria that have them resistant to antibiotics. Now, what's really neat is um, that picture on the bottom of your screen. Um, has the bacterial cell where the cell wall was ruptured and then the chromosome was actually spilling out into the environment and so they caught that um, on an electron micrograph so really really cool to take a look at all right so the ribosomes um, are involved in protein synthesis and the ribosomes because um, you've already studied that you know that but the ribosomes can be quite numerous there could be, in certain E. coli strains, anywhere from 7,000 to 25,000 ribosomes present. So the faster a cell reproduces, the more ribosomes it actually needs. So those that reproduce in like 20 minutes are amazingly fast in terms of their protein synthesis and have the higher end of the ribosome number. Now, endospores are one of those inclusion bodies that um, we talked about at the beginning of the unit. And endospores are a dormant cell type usually produced by the genera of bacillus and clostridium. Now we looked at both of those um, underneath the microscope in our morphology lab. And, um, and on that screen up on the smart board um, when we were doing a little bit of practice and identifying some of the cell shapes. The interesting thing about those endospores is they can remain dormant for up to a hundred years. They're not destroyed by heat, UV radiation, toxic chemicals, or even desiccation, which is drying out. So even removing the water from the environment, because we, we know that all cells need water, um, doesn't destroy them. So examples um, of infections that are caused by bacteria that produce endospores include tetanus, which is why you get a tetanus shot, um, botulism, anthrax and gas green. So you may have heard after 9-11 that those um, there were letters that were distributed through the mail with anthrax spores present in them. Um, very, very dangerous stuff. And so botulism is a little bit scary. Um, and actually I'm going to talk about that here on the next slide. But that picture down on the bottom left, you can see the endospore forming inside of that bacillus um, bacterium there. So the big concern for medical micro is that these spores can really survive anywhere for any amount of time. They're a little scary. So exactly how do they form? Because they're, they're an interesting type of inclusion body in that usually the cell dies um, after the endospore is made. So the process of sporulation is the formation of the endospores. And this typically occurs when there's low amounts of nitrogen or carbon in the environment. So you've got this same picture, I think, in your note packet, although I think yours is turned sideways. I don't have it in front of me right now. So the DNA ends up being duplicated. So we have two copies of the chromosome. A septum forms right down the middle. Okay, actually, I shouldn't say right down the middle, but somewhere near the middle of the cell, um, usually a little lopsided. And then there's a, a larger compartment and a smaller compartment, and that larger one actually engulfs the smaller one. In between where the two membranes are, a layer of peptidoglycan forms. 
um, in between. It's laid down in between as a protective layer. And then what happens is there's more peptidoglycan, usually um, alternated with like a, some form of a calcium carbonate um, compound that makes it really, really rigid um, and protected, and there's multiple layers of it. Once that spore coat is formed, the mother cell or that larger compartment actually ends up degrading and the endospore gets released. Now this could be done in as little as eight hours. So the scary thing is that sometimes that process occurs when, um, when cells, you know, when we're trying to destroy those cells. Sorry, my dog's going nuts right now. Um, so a really scary example of this is um, the, the Clostridium example. And Clostridium botulinum is the bacteria that causes botulism. So if, when you get food poisoning, when you get botulism, you either com come in contact with the bacteria or you come in contact with the spores. And it's really hard to tell which one um, you, you come in contact with. But here's the thing. A lot of people during natural disasters rely on canned, canned food, right? Because you don't have to refrigerate it pretty safe to eat, um, and it's because of the canning process. So during the canning process, typically the food is put under high heat, high pressure, and vacuum sealed. So all the oxygen is removed from the environment inside the can. Now, that whole process, the canning process, ends up um, uh, you know, causing sporulation to occur. So if there's bacteria, if there's any of that clostridium present, it goes through the sporulation process and creates those spores. So the cells aren't actually killed. But then the can sits on a shelf, right? It goes to the grocery store, sits on the shelf. Well, then it goes back to room temperature, so no more high heat. There's plenty of food in the can, obviously. So if the cell is heterotrophic, it's got plenty to eat. And then if it's an anaerobic bacterium, it doesn't need the oxygen. So here it is in a can in like the perfect environment. Plus it's moist. So then the spore germinates and it creates a whole new cell. Um, and in that process, when the cell becomes active again, it starts releasing gases. So the can literally like swells up and bulges. So if you ever are at the grocery store and you're walking around and you see cans on the shelf that, that are bulging, you should really tell somebody that works at the store so that way they can be removed because they could be really dangerous if people end up buying them and eating them. Um, so that's one reason why microorganisms that produce spores are so dangerous. Um, even though we attempt to destroy them, sometimes they can withstand all of our attempts. Plus, they can really be found anywhere, which is pretty scary. So that's it for notes. Um, at this point, study up, make sure you know the different structures, um, what they do, and how they can benefit bacteria.